So uh, thank you everybody for showing up. This is uh, going to be a fun couple of days. Um, first, I just wanted to give you a couple of uh, words on who uh, are those people that are trying to shovel some base into you. And uh, so uh, I'm Ricardo Fuzeroli. I've known Micah for quite some years now. Probably it's more than 10 years, right, Micah? Right, at least 10 years yeah. <laughs> since San Marino. <laughs> yes. Uh, and um, I've been following Micah's and Francesca's tour to journey into science with great excitement. It's, it's really great to see this group growing and all the amazing stuff that's coming out of your group, both in terms of science in the substantial way, but also in terms of methodologies and paradigms that can be further developed. So this is really exciting to get to interact with you. Um, my work is slightly different from what you do. I mostly work on how social interactions work and how they fail, um, both combining a cognitive and an interactional angle. So trying to look at the ways in which people actually interact in real time, mostly face to face. Uh, and I apply these to a bunch of conditions in which there are challenges to the structure of the interaction. So where there are interactions involving people with psychiatric conditions from autism to schizophrenia to depression, uh, but also parent-child interactions where you have a quite clear asymmetry in what the different interlocutors can do. But also in Danish, because if you've been in Denmark for a while now, you probably know that Danish poses some challenges to the abilities of exchanging uh, information with each other and, and interact. And there are some interesting twists and some interesting insights that the difficulties, that the challenges that Danish poses help us understand the structure of social interactions. Um, on the right there and uh, in the uh, list of small faces. There's also Chris Cox, who's a PhD student right now at the uh, linguistics at the is that the linguistics and language PhD school at this time, right? Yeah, and uh, he is interested in the ways in which infants explore and learn the sound structure of their first language. So looking at the properties of the linguistic environment in which people or children learn their language, but with the specific angle of looking at the active and interactive role of the child in shaping these environments, not just how do they learn from existing stimuli, and at the role of cognitive development in this. Uh, since we deal with these um, tricky domains of knowledge, not they're more tricky than others, but they're the ones we know, so we think they're the most challenging ever. Um, we had to sort of sharpen our methodological tools, and that's where Bayes came in. So what we're going to try to do today is to tackle through our experience uh, the ways in which, uh, or the reasons for which we should do Bayesian inference, and discuss a bit the potentialities and worries that you expressed in the questionnaire. Uh, we'll then pass to learning uh, the way that we practice Bayes via an example. And we'll take an example from uh, Chris master thesis and uh, with data that uh, another of my uh, PhD students, Christina Dietrichsen, uh, recorded, that's vowel articulation in Danish child-directed speech, but the specific of the problem uh, don't matter, it's just a fun example. And we will focus on the conceptual issues of setting up and running a uh, uh, Bayesian analysis, for instance, the issues with defining how priors uh, are in your model and checking the consequences of setting different kinds of priors. We're not going to focus on the technical aspects that are below the Bayesian inference. For instance, how the Marco chain Monte Carlo samplers work and that sort of things, because at least in my experience teaching, the technical aspects are a necessary step, but only once you know why you need to know 
just starting with the technical details doesn't give you the motivation and the specific gaze that helps you understanding the technical aspects. The, in terms of how the workshop is gonna be structured, we have um, short or relatively short conceptual explanations going through the example, including partial code and plots, which are interleaved with hands-on sessions where you go through the main points of the explanation, running the pre-written R and BRMS code and answering questions so that you can get your hands dirty and actually see in practice what we've been talking about. And we'd like to have discussion at any point. So at any point, just stop us. We don't have a tight uh, time schedule so we can adjust according to the questions that are there. And it's especially important to catch doubts very early on because that helps you understanding what comes after. Right? Um, the goal is not that you're going to be a Bayesian wizard at the end of the workshop, but you have a familiarity with Bayesian procedures and a basic template to run your analysis. You will, or we hope, to dispel your prior worries, right? We'll speak a lot about how to set priors because that's one of the worries that came up most in the questionnaire and generally when I teach Bayes. Uh, and we want to give you a lot of curiosity and motivation to learn more because what we can cover even in two days of workshop is only like a first taste of the true power of beings. Once we've done with this course, like the next obvious step for you would be to, uh, at least that's my advice, to go through this book, Statistical Rethinking by Richard McCarrieth, which is an amazing statistical test book written by an anthropologist and the combination of these two angles is very very inspiring because you can see how McCurry thinks of statistics as a way of building knowledge and not as a structure of mathematical dogmas that you need to follow or rules that you need to follow is a practice of building knowledge and with the book there's also a fantastic series of uh, video lectures that are freely available on YouTube Good. So just to give you even more detail on the exact learning blocks that we're going to go through, right, today we're going to cover a very general intro to Bayesian inference. And we'll start by building the simplest possible model, describing your data as a Gaussian distribution. We'll then do an exercise and break. And then in the second part of today, we're going to model difference of means as a Gaussian distribution which is very analogous to what people would usually call a linear regression with dichotomous predictor or a t-test. But in this Bayesian framework, you don't need to worry about which kind of test you're running. You're just telling the computer what you know about the data and the question you're asking. Once you tell the computer that, the computer rats the inference and you don't need to know whether it's a t-test, a repeated measure ANOVA, a Wilcox on something, something, and so on and so forth. And then we'll do an exercise. And tomorrow, we'll start by recap and questions. We'll move on to repeated measures discussing the, I'm sure that you're all familiar with this issue because it's very common in your imaging, but what does it mean to have individual and population modeling in the same model. This corresponds, again, just to give you anchors in your existing knowledge to multi-level hierarchical modeling, to random or varying effects, or to paired sample t-test in the specific case that we're gonna run. And the final part of the, um, of the workshop will be after we've learned how to build these models right, with, we'll see, skeptical priors, we'll start seeing, but what if we know more about the phenomenon at stake and we want to use prior from the previous literature? How do we deal with that? And how do we assess the impact of using these priors? And again, there's gonna be an exercise. 